Bonjour. Good morning. I'm Jeremy Larson, and I'm really looking forward to sharing with you my presentation on business model innovation via open APIs. A little bit about me. I'm MD of Growsmart Consulting, and I'm very plugged into the UK tech scene. I'm the ex UK General Manager and Director of Strategic Partnerships for Currency Fair, the leading currency exchange platform, and also the founder of General Manager, the General Manager of Telegraph Financial Services and at John Lewis Finance as well. Let me talk to you a little bit about the scale of the disruption and change that's likely to happen in financial services as a result of APIs. I think there's four key stages of evolution and we're just coming towards the end of that first stage now, Open Banking 1.0. This is what I call the creation of the ecosystem where what you're seeing through open APIs is a rapid unbundling of the traditional value chain and specialization around the creation of uh, what I call pure play product marketplaces. You see uh, alt-fi marketplaces like Funding Circle, you see currency exchange platforms like TransferWise, all developing an open API based model where they can integrate into other businesses. You're seeing that nascent embedding and you're seeing that transparency and availability of products. That's leading through to what I call Open Banking 2.0, where there's going to be a widespread customer and business adoption of open APIs in financial services. What you'll get with that is integration across all the key consumer and business markets, not just uh, ride hailing with Uber or booking micro, micro insurance in your travel app, um, but you're going to see the beginning of real personalization of products and services based on the need and the risk profile of that business or individual. That's going to lead through to the next wave of open banking innovation where the customers are going to be in control. I forecast within three years, you're going to see a rise of what I call customer agents or customer brokerages which are going to take customers' data and use that to negotiate for the right product and service at the right price. And that's gonna lead beyond 2025 into what I think this is the way that finance is going to be. You're gonna have ubiquitous integration of financial services across verticals, um, and you're gonna have what I call true customer agency as well. So what are the things that are enabling that evolution? So I think there's five tectonic shifts. One is that limitless reach and access of financial transaction data of individuals and consumers, uh, consumers and businesses based on the fact that with open APIs, you've got consistent data standards which can be utilized by third parties. What you're gonna get with that is ultra transparency as well. So for the first time, you're genuinely gonna be able to see a single customer view of an individual's or business's financial life and a transparency across the whole of the market for financial products and financial providers, which in turn is going to lead to an instant price and product feature comparison across product providers. So it's giving consumers more choice. There's also going to be that ability to personalize more because you'll have that clear understanding of a individual or uh, company's financial health and you'll be able to match the product price and volume that's appropriate to that customer or business at the right point in time. And that's going to lead to a greater consumer power. I've already mentioned that, but I believe within five years, customers will have the, uh, the ability to pull the right product uh, and service to them rather than be push product. You're beginning to see uh, businesses such as Plum, uh, Yolt, um, Money Dashboard, which are beginning to do that. They're not quite there yet, but within five years they will be. And then lastly, embedded finance is kind of the holy grail of financial services that you can have the right financial product and service available to that customer or business at the point of need, no matter what their journey is. So that's very much um, further unbundling the financial value chain and making financial services pervasive across all industries. 
So what it, does that mean in terms of the unbundling of the value chain? Well, traditionally, you'll see bank direct to customer on the left-hand side. What that has meant is that you've got incumbents who have traditionally vertically integrated and offered financial services to, directly to customers or businesses. Those, uh, those incumbents were responsible for the regulatory license, they're responsible for product manufacturing, they're responsible for risk management, they're responsible for uh, administration, and ultimately they were responsible for distribution. With open APIs, all of that can be unbundled. And you see there in this four layer uh, capability set that you now have with banking as a service, a number of different um, ecosystem players who are able to do certain parts of that traditional uh, financial services value chain, whether it's payment processing, whether it's acting as an API bridge, whether it's creating a financial services marketplace to be used by other financial services firms or non-financial services firms. And it's a real question now for banks, what role do they want to play in this growing banking as a service ecosystem? So what does that also mean for consumer proposition opportunities or business consumer uh, proposition opportunities? Well, you'll see um, on the top of this uh, layer cake, if you like, a number of different customer contexts, whether it's retail, health, wealth, or small businesses. And within each of these different journeys, there is a natural financial services use case, which can be applied at the point of need with embedded finance, with open APIs facilitating that. So you'll see underneath the embedded journeys, there's uh, a number of different requirements to be able to offer that. And uh, within each of these different layers, there are different banking as a service uh, ecosystem players, whether it's the payments transaction trails, whether it's capabilities like credit scoring or payment processing, whether it's financial services, product manufacturing, each of these are now being unbundled. So what does that mean for both incumbents in financial services and non-financial services players? So what I've done here is to split up the market between non-financial brands and financial, financial companies on the vertical axis and on the horizontal axis between traditional incumbents and digital challenges. And each of these quadrants has different strategic requirements. So if we take a look at the top left-hand side, so non-financial brands who are traditional, whether it's BMW or Marriott or FMCG companies, there are opportunities to include financial services to improve customer experience and to gain loyalty through um, not just an improved service, but an improved ability to get value uh, for that experience as well. So whether it's Avios and the claiming of points for travel or whether it's for BMW where there is a auto payment capability as uh, German drivers go through uh, tolls on autobahns. You know, these are just examples of being able to embed financial services in traditional non-financial brands. When we look on the right hand side for digital non-financial brands, whether it's Facebook or Airbnb or Just Eat or Uber, as we've talked about, again, there's ability to embed financial services in a way that's very natural for somebody to use one of those platforms, whether it's the ability to pay for a room on Airbnb, to pay for your meal on Just Eat, or to um, send a payment to your best friend via Facebook. All of these applications are now here today, and you'll have a look at uh, uh, the top right hand corner with the likes of Grab and Gojek. You've got the, um, this new development of super apps in Southeast Asia, where actually there are um, uh, customer hubs that are bringing in a number of different industries uh, and making uh, each of these apps kind of essential for customers in those regions, um, such as Grab, Gojek and Alipay. As we look at the financial services sector, you'll see that there is 
definitely a catch-up game on the left-hand side. So, you know, the likes of Barclays and HSBC have been making strategic investments in the banking as a service ecosystem and partnering with marketplace builders. And on the right-hand side, in terms of the fintechs, there is a race, um, both to acquire customers, but also to have the right partnerships in place so that they're able to offer more and more relevant financial services to their customers as well. So I've talked about banking as a service. Well, this is a rapidly developing ecosystem, but within that in the UK, there's at least five core groups of players within the banking as a service ecosystem. Um, on the one hand, you have, um, looking at the bottom, what I call financial use case or pure play um, providers. So these are the uh, alt-fi marketplaces like Upstart, EasyBob, uh, iWalker, um, funding options. Uh, all of these are using open APIs to link to banks to be able to offer uh, lending uh, at a cheaper rate than incumbents to, uh, to businesses. Um, for example, Currency Fair, Currency Cloud, TransferWise are using currency exchange as a service and uh, embedding that into different financial services and non-financial services firms as well. So that's the bottom circle. On the left-hand side, you've got what I call API portals, the likes of Codat, Plaid, Banking Circle, Rails Bank, which are providing ways in which to link uh, the data from incumbents through to different third parties and different users of that data to be able to then offer it to businesses and consumers. So those are the, the rails or the API portals that are enabling this to happen. Right in the middle, you've got the payment processing platforms that are using all of that data and managing to make it a seamless and fluid process to be able to automate all of those transactions. That's the likes of Modular, um, which are partnering with the likes of Revolut and others, Stripe in the US, um, Braintree as well in the US. And then you've got at the top, you've got banking platform builders, the likes of BBVA, the second biggest Spanish bank, that's actually had the strategic foresight to see that this is uh, inexorable development, banking as a service, and it needs to be able to offer a vehicle to be able to uh, en enable um, uh, financial services to be offered to third parties outside of the bank as well. Banking Circle is another provider in there. And then lastly, you've got on the right-hand side, what I would call marketplace builders, which are um, companies who are developing financial services supermarkets, if you like, for uh, incumbents. A notable example is Bud, who are developing their marketplace for HSBC and others. I will go into some of those customer propositions that have been developed at the moment, but I talked about um, instant micro insurance, the point of travel. I've talked about Uber already. In transport, you can get on demand motor insurance. I've already talked about Facebook and uh, WeChat how you can have instantaneous payments to anybody in your network. Um, salary finance, immediately available at the point of need. Uh, a great partnership between BBVA and salary finance. And then you can finally get the mortgage application and offer within a home buying app as offered by Zoopla in partnership with Trussell. So there's a whole range of customer propositions that are being developed. So what are some of these untapped and underexploited opportunities? So in verticals where there's been the beginnings of embedded finance, but so much further to go, you know, I, I give you all of these as real opportunities for developing open API type applications and embedded finance. Trade and logistics is an obvious one. Um, health and wellness, you know, the ability to understand uh, how your health is improving with fitness apps and seeing how that might impact uh, life insurance premiums or personal medical insurance, um, longevity and cross-generational. I think there's a massive opportunity for the ability to um, 
have a, a, a family-wide view of financial services and to use open APIs to be able to make it easier to, um, to share finance between generations in a family. Media and gaming, you've seen the likes of Fortnite and how it is a significant um, payment uh, platform. Manufacturing supply chain, uh, smart energy, uh, transport solutions I've mentioned as well, but there's more in terms of mobility solutions as well. Education, construction, real estate and urban planning are just but a few of those verticals where there are still untapped opportunities for uh, embedded finance and open API uh, use cases. And what are some of those horizontal applications which I think open APIs and embedded finance will see uh, in the future? Well, I've talked about proposition personalization and customer agency. I want to talk to you a little bit about next best action, financial life management and financial decision optimization. So what I mean by that last one, finance decision optimization, is that by having a single customer view of a customer or business, the ability to be able to offer the right financial product at the right time based on that customer's need or life stage, life stage or financial health um, becomes available, becomes possible. And I think you're going to be able to see a number of different solutions. I mean, the likes of Plum and Money Dashboard are trying to get to that point. And those and others like those two companies are going to be able to help customers and businesses make the right kind of financial decision for them. Here is one very wide overview of all the different types of open API and embedded finance use cases that could be applied to all of those different industries in the left hand column there. So there's a huge number of applications which you know, I urge you to have a look at because they could apply to your business as well. So what are some of those real strategic questions, um, depending on where you are in the value chain uh, and ecosystem, you know, whether you're a non-financial brand or whether you're an incumbent or a fintech. So for non-financial uh, brands, there's a huge opportunity for the most trusted brands and those with the most brand stretch to really benefit from offering open API financial services. Customers expect more experience integration with finance across non-financial services. And there's only the surface that's been scratched so far in terms of API uh, driven use cases. So there's so much opportunity within non-financial brands. Big tech, well, you've seen some investments in big tech already. Amazon alone has 14 different financial services businesses um, based on cloud payments and improving supply chain finance for its uh, marketplace sellers. Um, what you'll see, my prediction, is that you'll have more investments and a greater reach of big tech across that open banking and embedded finance ecosystem as well. For example, Google already has a US banking license and Amazon is applying for one. We've talked about banking as a service and the different actors within that uh, environment, that, that ecosystem. And I believe there's going to be a range of both consolidations and strategic acquisitions by both incumbents um, and uh, industry players to enable a stake at the table. You've seen Plaid recently acquired by Visa. Openworks has also been recently acquired. Rails Bank has acquired the UK business from Wirecard, you'll see more of these kinds of acquisitions and consolidations. And I believe the ones who are going to be the winners are going to be the ones which have the most connective and integrative capabilities. For example, Banking Circle, but it's really about the power of partnerships as well. So what about for fintechs as well, consumer and business facing fintechs? So it's a key priority for their continued customer acquisition and revenue growth. The likes of TransferWise have made it a strategic priority for them to lead in the open API space. And it really does provide that differential edge in banking as a service and B2B2C distribution. Partnerships, as I've mentioned, proposition are key USPs and capabilities. And then lastly, for the incumbents, well, this is something that isn't going to go away. 
further unbundling of the value chain is going to happen. The likes of Saxo Bank and BBVA have demonstrated a high growth, profitable model to spin out banking as a service. And really, the question is, what are the other incumbents going to do? Um, strategic bets really need to be taken now for both defensively shoring up their position, but also to take advantage of those growth opportunities. It's really going to be about buy, build, and partner for incumbents. Before I go, I just wanted to share, well, what is that value opportunity for open API finance and embedded finance? Well, it's massive. Um, the totality of embedded finance at today is, a is around about 700 million in terms of global revenues that are being made. But, or 700 billion rather, but by 2030, that is going to approach nearly 8 trillion across embedded payments, embedded lending, and embedded insurance. So what is your innovation opportunity? What are the strategic questions you need to be considering now? Well, firstly is, well, what are the propositions you could build from open APIs and embedded finance? I've talked about the size of that opportunity. What, what you need to be thinking about is, well, where are those adjacent and relevant financial use cases and product markets? And what incremental revenues can be made? And how significant could those new streams be? It's always going back to customers and clients, right? To think about, well, what really are their needs? Because that's where you'll unlock the innovation opportunity. So what are their key financial needs at the point of need in their journey for your business? What are the new customer audiences and segments that could be reached and acquired? And how will that be a key differentiator for you in your industry and make your business stand out? What are the capabilities you need to have to develop this? So it's not just technology, but very much the next point, it's really about partnerships. So really this strategic com competency will distinguish the winners in this ecosystem. And then innovation is very important. I talk about partnerships and proposition. Well, proposition is very, very interesting. So I don't think we even really think uh, we have a true handle on how propositions can develop, what new business models can truly um, develop from the spread of open APIs and uh, banking as a service. Um, you need to think about how you can leverage a customer's transaction data and then see how you can personalize products, price and volume by life stage and channel. I've given a few, I think, radical innovations in terms of horizontal different business models. Let's see if they emerge. And then lastly, it's really about competitive strategy. So what will um, lower barriers to entry for offering finance products have as an impact on your business, both negative and positive? How are you able to grow and defend against new threats? So look, that was the presentation, business model innovation via open APIs, new growth opportunities for platforms, and new propositions for customers. I'm Jeremy Larson, MD at GrowSmart. There are my contact details. I would love to have another conversation with you about this opportunity. It's a very exciting space and you can't ignore it. Thank you very, very much. I look forward to speaking to you soon.